I think. Screen so. looks good, yes. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Paul Griffiths, and this is Live and Uncut. I'm delighted to welcome my guest today, uh, Alan Brio from Phoenix, or close to Phoenix in Arizona. Welcome, Alan. Thank you. Welcome, Paul. It's uh, really great for you to join me. And the reason why we're early today, folks, is the fact that Alan's got a, an appointment to keep with one of his uh, students at, uh, at the usual time that we go to 8 o'clock. So it's going to be a slightly shorter show than uh, than usual uh, so that Alan can keep to that commitment, which is very important. We'll be talking more about that side of his work. Um, but as you know, the way I like to start my show off is, Alan, what was your first recollection of a camera in your household? <laughs> My mother had a box brownie Kodak, you know, which yeah. we used on all the vacations and uh, took it along with us. And then my first personal camera was actually a Polaroid Type 80, a Polaroid Land Type 80, which I still have. Oh, <clears> and fantastic. I, I've worked a lot with Polaroid cameras, actually. Um, my first serious commitment to landscape photography was done with a 4x5 Arca Swiss and a Polaroid back. And I did okay. not have anything else. I wanted the immediate. Uh, uh, photograph, you know, in the film. Yeah, you didn't want to send the developer uh, off to the developers and wait for the uh, the film uh, to come back. Yeah, especially when you travel, which is very difficult. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. My, my sort of early version of digital, where I had the result right away, but I had to develop the film. Uh, with the yeah. yeah, we were talking just be before the show. Your, your your mother was an artist, and uh, it seems as though art and photography were well established in your life at a very early age. Art, yeah, and my parents were not, well, my parents did some photography, but um, I don't think it was very developed, but art, yes, yeah. I was raised, uh, you know, my mother was an artist, my father was an engineer, so I had both trainings, you know, in a way, and, and it helps me a lot today because obviously one of the challenges for an artist is how to mitigate the artistic aspect of the endeavor with the business responsibilities that come with it. And yeah. artists are traditionally very, you know, inadequate in business because obviously they're very emotional, they are very centered on creativity, on, you know, emotion and all of that, which obviously, you know, in business, emotion and business don't go very well together. So having both sides helps me a lot, you know. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that, that's a very good point you make there, actually, because, yeah, uh, how many times have I heard it that the photographer loves to do his work, but when mm. he becomes a professional, then he finds it's very difficult to do the business side of it because he just wants to be out making photographs. Yeah, yeah. I often say that a lot of photographers or a lot of artists should not be allowed to sell their own work. They would yeah. be better <laughs> having somebody else. And I think that's why galleries are so successful because the principle yeah. of a gallery is exactly that. The artist doesn't sell their work. Somebody else yeah. takes care of it, and the artist is free to create as much as they want. Um, in reality, the business model is not all that good because you only get 50% of the money, which hurts mm -hmm. yourself financially because to make the same amount as if you sold it yourself, you have to create twice as much. Mm -hmm. However, in some instances, that's probably better because artists and, and clients come to clash at times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was just, while you were saying that, I was just thinking of Michael Kenner, who lives, uh, lives up there in uh, Seattle. And the amount of traveling that he does with the sign, the book signings, and obviously selling his prints, but a lot of his work, in actual fact, is sold through the galleries. Uh, right. He's doing doing a little bit of work at home, does his own printing at home, but the majority of it is is through the galleries. When right. um, <clears throat> well, from so your art, guys, sorry, go ahead, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say when uh, your art developed, you you went to study art in 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 Paris. Yeah, I did the Beaux Arts. That was my my first training as an artist, uh, formal training. I mean, I did art at home, but uh, the first formal training was the Beaux Arts. And, uh, you know, we did painting and drawing all day long, basically, that was it. And uh, after three or four years of that, I got a little tired of it. And I wanted to, I tried photography. I, I realized that to me, photography was more adequate to capturing the world today than painting. And, right. You know, there's some pros and cons. And, you know, obviously your painting is a much more in, you know, involved approach. You, you, you make a painting over hours, if not days or weeks or months, while the photograph is done in an instant. Yeah. But I, I found that the photograph had, had more of a contemporary appeal to me. And, and that's yeah. why I wanted photography. Well, uh, what sort of time, period of time was this then when you basically realized that photography was a better route for you to go rather than staying with your well, with, well, with your like, art? 80, 1985, you know, something like that. Okay. Yeah. 
And, and when did you... Uh, because people in, in, in the art world in France thought that photography was for roles that cannot draw. You know, so there was this sort of yeah. stigma attached to it. <laughs> And I suppose no, I've, I've, you, you've got some you've got some beautiful landscape in in France. What can I ask the reason why and how you ended up in Arizona? Well, I mean, I think the you know there's a number of reasons. Um, one of them is simply the attraction of the American West. You know, the, the we we see probably more people travel in the American West from Europe than from the United States. Actually, so there's an enormous right. draw. Yeah, and in order to do justice to the photography, living here is is really necessary because if you just travel, you end up doing snapshots. You know, you end up being caught yeah. in in the moment where you want to photograph everything, and it's very superficial as as a body of work. So, and obviously the question is, why Arizona in particular? Was that the state that you decided this was where well, you, you wanted actually, to establish yeah, yourself? I mean, I, that's my favorite state. Um, you know, for many reasons. One of them being that it has the access to all the Southwest, you know. Um, yeah. It, it's very convenient, you know. If you've, you've, got, a, you've, got, a, you've got a number of uh, national parks around the area, not too far away from uh, the Grand right. Canyon, I take it. That sort of area, well, well, it's a yeah. bit of a distance to go. Right, exactly. It's very quick, yeah. 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 It, used to be, it used to be quicker because I used to live in Canada Shea where I was only 10 minutes away. Well, now I'm a few hours away. Um, yeah. And I've lived in a number of places, usually trying to look at myself <clears throat> as close as I could to the landscape to save on travel cost and to save on, on travel time. You know, mm. so I lived uh, on the Navajo Reservation for seven years. I've also lived uh, in, in, uh, in Michigan for three years, in the upper peninsula of Michigan, where I was very, very yeah. close to, uh, you know, Lake Superior and all the landscapes of the northern mm. United States region. But it was too cold, so one of the choices that I've made yeah, is to, I was going to say, uh, it's a bit cold up there sometimes. <laughs> very cold, minus 20, um, God, very, yeah. very cold. And I've decided that I'd rather, you know, as I said to people, I'd rather fry than freeze, you know. <laughs> yeah, very true, very true. What um, was the reason for you moving to Arizona to, to, um, to establish yourself in the photography, or did you go was there another reason for you going to America prior to it? Was it just, was it purely a photographic reason to move to America? I, I came here as a student and originally I did not know that I would make a living out of photography. I was photographing as a hobby <clears throat> and I had, it took me a number of years to know, to figure that out, but I had this hidden or unknown belief in my head that I couldn't make a living doing what I liked. Um, probably out of hearing people telling me, you know, so many negative things about art. And, and yeah. a lot of artists don't realize how much negativity there is in that. Uh, I don't, in the US, you're told very, very frequently that um, um, you don't be a starving artist, you know, that art cannot, you know, pay the bills on and on and on and on. And so eventually, rather than try, a lot of people assume that that's true. And, you know, yeah. in my head, it became that, you know, where I believe that I could not make a living doing what I like. It was an unknown belief. And uh, what happened is I went all the way through my studies from, you know, working on a bachelor and getting it to working on a master's degree, getting it to working on a PhD, uh, a doctorate. And the PhD is a very difficult endeavor that requires an enormous amount of work and commitment. And I got to the point after three years in the PhD program where I was underpaid, overworked, and I no longer enjoying what I was doing. Yeah. And I, I came to home one day and I thought, how much harder would it be to do what I like, which was photography? And the conclusion was that it couldn't be harder because I was working as hard as I could. And so at that point, I told my wife, let's just go <clears throat> and try to make a go at it and just try to match my income as what I was at the time, a graduate teaching assistant, a GTA. And I was making $600 a month. And I thought, well, $600 a month is $20 a day. Can I make $20 a day selling photographs? And the answer is yes. And that's how I started. And that's the $20 fantastic. became 40, became hundreds, thousands, and on and on and on. Lovely. It is uh, so the the situation you you actually taking this this move and I, and to be quite honest with you, your 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 comment there about negativity about uh, doing what you love and not doing what you have to do to put food on the table is very very. Uh, prominent in this country as well, and I think throughout Europe, to be quite honest with you, the as many people out there would far prefer to be doing what they love rather than doing what they have to do. 
Sure. So when you moved to in, in when you moved into photography, your main aim at this stage now in your career was I'm going to take some photographs, I'm going to print those, and I'm going to sell my photographs. There was nothing else at the time that you thought you would want to develop on the photographic front. What do you mean by develop? Uh, well, did, did you at the time, were you thinking about further down the line that you were going to start teaching, creating your workshops and writing books? No, because I did not have the luxury of doing that. I had to make a living. Yeah. The, the, the rest of my activities besides the selling of prints are outcomes of the selling of prints. It's because I was successful in selling prints that I had the funds to do the rest. Really? Yeah. You, you, writing a book, let's just take writing a book as an example. Writing a book is a one to two year affair, usually two yes. years, one year writing and then one year editing and publishing. It means two years of good income because you got to work at it. I mean, you can do a little bit on the side, but you can't do a whole lot. I, yeah. I could not afford to have two years of work without a solid income. When I left uh, the university and I decided to make a living with photography, I was in debt um, at the tunes of several tens of thousands of dollars. I had a car that was basically falling apart and, I, and my most the valuable possession was actually my cameras. I had nothing, yes. I had no savings. I, I told my wife, I said, you know, uh, we have to make a living, uh, sorry, we have to make a choice between being rich and being famous. And I looked at her and I said, and we don't have the option of wasting time to be famous. <laughs> We're yes. just gonna have to go for rich because we gotta repay those debts. And if we go at the rate at which people normally repay their debt, because I was by then uh, in my 40s, we are never gonna repay them. Yeah. How so we, have, we do have the luxury of time, really. Yeah, yeah. How, how this is probably going to sound uh, a, 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 a difficult question. How quickly was it before you established your photographic mm -hmm. business that you were selling your prints? I started in 19, when well, I quit the university, I, I, went in, I was in a PhD program just to back up a little bit from 93 to 92 to 95, so three years. I quit mm -hmm. in 95. And it took me two years to actually um, really get started selling prints. And mm -hmm. that was in 1997. Uh, I was making six figures around 1998, 99. Right. Okay. So, so you know, you know, you know, there's there's a there's a period there of establishment. There's a period there of of rooting any, any down business, your work and, and getting it. Getting it doesn't it really out. matter what you sell. Any business is going to take a couple of years to get started. Yeah, in order for you to just get all the the logistics worked out. The concept, you know, a lot of my students, you know, obviously I teach marketing among other things. A lot of my students think that they are going to open a website, uh, they are going to put their work for sale, and within a month they are going to make, you know, I don't know, you know, four figures, five figures, six figures. Yeah, That's exactly. Completely delusional. It's, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. You can suddenly open a website and put your work for sale within literally minutes. Uh, I mean, I, at one time I showed a student how fast it went. Doing it on Etsy, I was able to set up a website and start selling my work on Etsy within five minutes. But but I never got any customers because I never promoted it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, and the rest, uh, the problem of selling is 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 sort of confused now because people can open a website within minutes, but the the promotion doesn't take any any shorter, right? <laughs> No, it, that's, that's, a, that's a very important point, the promotion part of it. It's an interesting part of uh, sort of the decade that you're talking about, the latter 90s here, Alan, because really the internet was, was, was around and there was a fair bit of internet, but the social activity which we now experience was, was a long, long way off. Uh, I don't think Facebook would have been around. It probably was in its very, very early, early basics in, when the guys wow. were mocking about in the universities. There was no Google Plus and there was no... Uh, of any of these internet searches. So how did you go about promoting your work? Well, I mean, I never sold on the internet until, um, you know, the, the probably the early 2000s. Yeah. My, I, my, my big break was to find a, a location to sell my work at the Grand Canyon. And the Grand Canyon gets 5 million visitors a year on the South Rim. Out of 5 million, um, you know, only a small percentage buy, but even if you take 1%, you know, you have thousands, right? Yes. So that was my big break. Yeah. To get to that location was a lot of work. I mean, obviously, I had competition, there was challenges, and that's why those two years were spent basically trying to get there. You know, yeah. so that, that's the part that a lot of photographers don't take into account. They open a website, they just wait. Well, you're going to wait forever. You know, because yeah. the, the hard part is not finding the place, the hard part is getting to make that place work for you. 
you know, yes. I, I actually found the Grand Canyon the, the day that I, I went back to Arizona because I, I did a PhD in Michigan. And so we drove back from Michigan to Arizona because we wanted to live in Arizona. And after we drove back to Arizona, we took a trip to the Grand Canyon and I immediately saw this location as being the solution. But it took me two years to get there because obviously yeah. People are not willing to just make room for you, you know. No, exactly right. No, you're, you're the magical chairs, you know, the patch, musical yeah. chairs. All the chairs are taken, and in order for someone to yeah. leave their chair, there's going to be to have a little bit of a dance, right? And exactly so the right. Was that little dance, if we want, you know. Yeah, uh, um, yeah. What uh, sort of equipment are you using at this stage? You mentioned the uh, um, the your um, uh, camera earlier on, which was um, was it the Arca Swiss? Did you say? That was way back in the uh, early 80s, yeah. The early 80s. What sort of equipment have you moved on to now, we'll say, around about the late 90s? Well, I mean, I evolved over the years to just with every kind of equipment, you know. But, at the, you know, from 35 to medium format to 4x5, basically, using film. And then back down to 35 millimeter digital, and then now medium format digital, because we don't have 4x5 digital. So. No. You know that's what I use now is 35 millimeter digital and for, and medium format digital. Okay, yeah. So because uh, when I was reading on your website, I, I think we were talking about this yesterday. I thought you were medium format film photographer with 35 millimeter film. That you were still predominantly a film photographer, but uh, you you well, my, my, you, do, you do digital. Right. One of the reasons why I was extremely successful very rapidly, you know, because getting to yeah. the success that I've had in in just four years is very very fast. Is because I was using digital, yeah, and not film. And of course, that that digital is is really how you originally started off with your Polaroid, your Polaroid backs on your camera. You wanted to see that image straight away. Right. Of course, I, I want that immediate feedback. Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, yeah. A, I'm very big on immediate reward. Uh, what we call uh, instant reward. You know, I, I like to buy yeah. things, and I don't like stores where you buy something and then they have to take six months to ship it to you. You know, I want to buy it. It's okay to ship it to me, but today not tomorrow not in six months yeah, yeah very true i agree with that that's, I mean, that nothing worse. Than, that's what people call it you know yeah, yeah there's no nothing worse than placing your order and say well it's going to be around about 10 15 days to come to you no i, I want it i want it now i want to i want to read that book now right I, i'm actually getting to that point now because in a sense um i think it comes with a certain understanding that that very rare things or things that are unique are going to be have to be made for you and so at that point, you know, you, you have yeah. to take into account the fact that they don't exist, right? But that's different. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to come to that later on, actually, because I think when with the little pre-chat we had before the show, I thought I found really, really interesting how much you put into the productivity of a print, which is a, which is a is a fascinating conversation which we're going to have. What I'd like to do now, though, Alan, is let's have a look at your work. Let's go screen share sure. and uh, go to your website. Um, and um, you're no you're gonna you're gonna see uh, you're gonna see my page first to start off with, but I'll quickly switch it over and to uh, to your website. And and for the viewers that are, are watching the show now and uh, will be watching on YouTube later, this is such a detailed website. You, you you cannot go wrong with this website. There's literally everything here for you to uh to see there's there's the menus down on the left hand side and you've obviously got all the other options down here dvds these books cases all sorts of things and obviously alan's blog but what i want to do alan i want to go to the um photography galleries and uh, as i um uh, I, I noticed a folder here which is best of 2015 so we're only eight months into the <clears throat> nine right. months into the year right. now so we've still got a few months to go but what i'd like to do is as i as you see these images if you could just talk about the images regards to where you uh where you, where where the place is and what camera you were looking with using and just describe the image to us as we go through them alan do you want to start with the one at the top here yeah. yes you go go with the top and i'll scroll down if you want me to miss one out i'll, I'll do that I'm, I'm in charge of the screen and you just uh right. you just talk away um, well, there's so many of them, I don't think we can do all of them, but I can try on the first one. This is a, actually, this photograph is actually a collage of, uh, I believe, four photographs. I, it's a very large expanse. Um, the photograph doesn't always give you a clue as to how wide the expanse is, but this is a huge mm -hmm. expanse. The clouds at the top of the image are actually straight over my head when I photographed, and so I had to take the camera and basically 
shoot upwards and then all the way until I was looking straight up over my head. I do that a lot. You know, I, I collage photographs a lot because there is no lens wide enough. I actually use fisheye lenses, but of course they give you round images. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the phenomenon, you know, the effect you get from a collage, or some people call it a stitch, you know, but I like to use the mm -hmm. word collage because it's an artistic word. Well, the word stitch is a technical word. The, the effect mm -hmm. you have from a collage is different from the effect you have with a single capture with a super wide lens. And, and that's because you're doing, you're moving the camera, you know. And uh, I do that a lot. About half of my work, if not 75% of my work, consists of collage images. Okay. In, in a lot of my work, not, not just this image in particular, but the majority of my work, I work on two things, which is form and color. And so I pay extremely high level of, of, of attention to the colors in the image, you know, refining the color, cleaning the color, and to the form of the uh, elements in the image, transforming the form, you know, and in Photoshop, you can use warp, you can use reformat, you can use stretch, you can use all sorts of tools, but we are never available in uh, film photography. And to me, it was a frustrating part of photography because in painting, you can do anything you want. You can choose the colors and you can choose the form and you can modify it as you like. In photography, we couldn't. We were sort of locked into the yeah. form and the colors given by the camera and we are not anymore. And to me, that's an enormous amount of freedom. And I, I honestly believe that if it had not been for the advent of, of digital photography, I probably would have quit photography because it became very frustrating. Yeah, sure. And you would have gone back to, gone back to the art form. Yeah, I'm not sure what I would have done. I mean, I could have gone back to painting or I could have just, you know, done something else. But mm. it had become very frustrating. And at the end, actually, I was only doing black and white because that was the domain, that was the medium that gave me the most freedom. I could actually yes. modify the tones. You know, yes. I couldn't modify the form, I couldn't modify the tones. But I was never so, satisfied with black and white printing in the dark room, so. Yeah. So this uh, second image here, Flames of Antelope, uh, we see a lot of these uh, images over in the UK where people have made the trip out to... Uh, right to the to these uh, these caves um yeah, beautiful yeah. light that's come through a, an opening here well if you think of form and color this is the ideal location and it's not a surprise that a very large number of photographers are fascinated by these places because you know their photography is about form color and light you know if you mm -hmm. don't have color if you do black and white then it's about form light and shades of gray and these places are about that it's about the light the forms you know and, and the shades or the colors. So yeah. we have photographers paradise. You can go there every time you go. You have a different, you know, photograph, a different possibility yeah. to find something new. How much time do you actually spend uh, editing your photographs uh, back at home on the computer? Uh, an, an enormous amount of time, because to me, the, the beauty of digital is that things, the, the capture, you know, the photograph. Uh, the image capture, that's what I call it, is only the beginning, it's a starting point. I'm, I'm at the point now where I call it an esquisse. An esquisse is a technique, uh, you know, an artistic word that means a very quick sketch before you start a painting, you know, a very quick overview of the shapes, the, the, the layout of the painting. And for me, a capture, an image capture, a, a raw file is an esquisse. It's a beginning point, it's a very quick overview. It's what the camera did. And yes. from there, what I do in um, the digital darkroom in my computer, is actually transform what the camera captured into what I, f I see uh, or what I want or what I, I experience emotionally. Yeah. yeah. Let's just uh, scroll down. We'll miss a couple of images out here. Let's we'll scroll down. This again is another um, quite a popular place to take for. This is the, is this the horseshoe? This is Canyon de Shea actually in Northern Arizona, Northeastern Arizona on the Navajo Reservation. I've actually lived there seven years. Uh, I, I lived. 10 minutes away from that particular overview overlook sorry right yeah um, so very, very, very i love i love this we i know we were talking a short while ago about monos but i was looking at this one earlier on and i just love the twists in the branches of this cactus is this is beautiful uh this done with the fish islands by the looks of things right this one is done with a fish eye lens it's the canon um eight to 12 millimeter lens which is uh came out last year i believe it's it's not a rectilinear lens. It has the distortion of a fisheye, and that's why you see the horizon being curved in the back. Yeah, but that doesn't yeah. bother me at all because it adds dynamism. Oh. A very important aspect of my work is that I'm not doing documentation. My goal is not to document the landscape. I have no desire to show things as they are. My really? goal is to show things as I see them. And so this is an artistic approach. And, yes. Uh, 
uh, you know, yes, the, okay, things are manipulated yeah. in my work are either through the camera here on the lens or through, you know, the processing that I've done afterwards. Yeah. And actually, I have a disclaimer on my site in the crisis section. If you go there, you'll see it. That says that if the camera, the photographs were not manipulated in some way, um, you get a full refund. So mm. obviously, <laughs> they all are. Yeah. Uh, looking at this one here also interests me. Uh, it seems to get caught on the monitors at the moment and be attracting me. Is this some uh, form of a, a infrared type uh, version that you've made with it? No, uh, with I, I haven't uh, just done digital infrared so far. I might do in the future. It's simply the, the colors of the scene, you know, due okay. to an extreme increase in contrast, where I made the sky black and I made these uh, branches almost white, you know. Yes, that, that's what is is causing that. So the desire when I, when I do black and white, you know, in these instances, this one and then the one of the characters before the Soraro, I, I want to create a very dramatic image. So I go for a full black sky if possible, and and a lot of yeah. contrast. Yeah, uh, I really like that photograph. Another one of the of the. Uh, that's also black, by the way, because I, the lens couldn't capture. That, you know, which is the, the this is a collage with the the mono. Yeah. I couldn't capture the Fantastic. tree and the reflection at the same time. I was actually very close to that tree. Uh, I'm with you. If I backed up and there was land in front of it, I couldn't see the reflection. Very often in landscape photography, you're sort of forced into a position physically because if you want to see the reflection, you have to be just over the pond and then you can't capture the yeah. whole tree even with wide angle because you're not far enough. And if you back up, then you don't lose the reflection. And that's where the yeah. collages come from. They allow me to extend the view as much as I need. Yeah, that's, uh, I can see where you're doing that now. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, so another one of the canyon. And I just wanted to f uh, to show this one here with this lovely light coming through the opening by the by the ladder there and uh, reflection on the far wall. Uh, yeah. where where is this uh, taken, Alan? This is in southern Utah, in uh, you know an area called Cedar Mesa, where it has a lot of Indian ruins and uh, these underground okay. caves, which we are called kivas. They're underground ceremonial rooms that were used, uh, you know, about a thousand years ago by the, the people that live there, the civilization that lived there, which was the analysis. Yeah. And uh, again, for more uh, photographs of this fantastic landscape. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to finish with the reeds because, let me just check. Uh, yeah, these two at the bottom. Uh, uh, it's this this surprised me actually when I, I scrolled down to this because obviously I'm looking at landscapes and I've seen the cactus obviously and, and the tree and the, and the pond and that and then we've got this dare I use the term what I'd like a beautiful abstract here of these reeds mm -hmm. um, do you have a tendency to to stay with landscapes uh, or are you sort of uh, do, are there other areas which you like to take, or is it just purely? Well, I feel like a lot of cars. I mean, you know. Oh yes, well, yeah, we could. <laughs> hobby, hobby. Your hobby, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, abstractions. You know, uh, Dali said that uh, you know there is no abstraction. You abstract things by removing elements. Yes. So what ha what what an abstraction is is simply a, a process of removing things until you get to just a little little bit of information that, that doesn't give you enough to make sense of the whole scene. And so you become immersed in the shapes, in the colors, in yeah. the forms, in the light, as opposed to asking yourself, you know, where is it, right? Uh, one mm -hmm. of the problems with photography is people look at a photograph and they say, where is it? And then they want to go there and take the photo themselves. It, it's, it was a very important aspect in my own development as an artist to understand that that's, that's actually futile. That, you know, suddenly I can find out where something is and suddenly I can go there myself and suddenly I can take a photo, but I'll never be the photographer that took the photo that influenced me because exactly. I'm not him or I'm not her. And so you have to learn to really appreciate art for what it is, not because you know where it is, but because you understand that art is the result of a particular emotional response that only one person can have. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's when you start to collect art, you know, that's, that's exactly the result, right. of yeah. which I do, yeah. you know, I have a very large art collection. I'm going to finish on this uh, this final one, this uh, beautiful shot of the reeds, lovely reflection. Yeah, again, form and color there. and light, you know, this is, this is what I work with, you know. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I'm going to stop the, uh, the screen share there, Alan, because <clears throat> Uh, we've got about 20 minutes left of, of, of time with you. Um, 
I want to talk. Uh, I want to talk about the productivity side. There's just one question I'll ask you because it's very important because it's so prominent on your website with regards to the workshops and the books. Mm. When did the workshops and the books start to develop into your photographic career? Well, I like I said, I started the business in '95. I started being financially successful in terms of making an income at it in '97. I did not start offering the workshop until 2003, I believe, the very first one. Right. And that's because I didn't have the time. I was so mm. busy selling prints. There was a, a tremendous change in my business around to that time, 2003, where I, I moved from selling volume to selling quality. And that meant that all of a sudden I had more time on my hands. Because when you do volume, you know, I, when I was sitting at the Grand Canyon, just to give you an idea, I would be selling about a thousand to 1500 prints a week. Wow. Uh, you know, at one time we countered 700 head by tens in one week. And, uh, you know, you add a few other large size and York at that 1500 number. It's a volume such that when I was doing it, I had to have three printers going at the same time, three different computers sending to three different printers, stacks of paper, stacks of ink, you know, cartridges. Yeah. I could not keep up. In 2003, I realized that this had to come to an end, and I, and I totally changed my marketing model from printing you know, in quantity to printing in quality. But obviously, because if you do quantity, you have to give up the quality. You just can't do, you can't yes. spend that much time per print. You know, matting, framing, um, what I call curating, that takes a lot of time. If you make quantity, you just make a print, put it in a plastic bag, and sell it. Mm -hmm. If you do quality, you take make a print, and then a week later, it goes for sale. <laughs> you know. Yeah, um, we actually now take three days to degas the prints, for example, and and another two or three days to mat them and frame them. So it's a much slower process. How does it work? How can you go from one to the other? The only solution is to increase your prices dramatically by a factor of ten or higher. Which yes. I did. So all of a sudden, and then of course adapt the marketing to you know be able to sell you know yeah. at that higher price because if you if you make an increase in price you have to make an increase in marketing because it's harder to sell something high price than something low price. The reason why a lot of photographers have very low prices is because you get to a point where your prices are so low that there is no need for marketing of anything, of any yes. nature. The marketing is the price. You know, if somebody says, I don't know if I should buy that, it's only five bucks, you know. I mean, how many people hesitate to buy a postcard? Nobody, right? You know, yes. um, when I started selling my work, I had no concept of marketing. I was selling note cards. Nobody hesitated. They are two dollars, two dollars and fifty cents. You know. Yeah. When you start to sell things in the thousands of dollars, you have to do a whole lot more work at the level of justifying the price. And I was able to do all of that. You know, learning marketing. Um, you know, was a very important part of it. Learn, learning marketing to sell luxury, not to sell volume. And, and as a result, I found myself with more time on my hands. And that's when I started doing the books, doing the, the, the workshop and all of that. <clears throat> How many workshops in a year do you do now? I do relatively few. Um, you know, I think the most I do is eight, um, okay. which is, you know, a very small number. Yeah. Well, Sometimes eight is what, nearly, nearly, well, it's two thirds of the year. So it's... Uh, and then obviously it's bringing an income in. And then, as we were saying, which is obviously the reason why the show's on, the, the workshops have this uh, period of time where obviously there's a, a, where your clients, the people who have been on the workshops with you want to come back and, and have a, ch a chat with you with regards to how they're developing with their work. And right. that's an ongoing process, yeah? Yeah, the most important aspect of the workshops, if we talk about that, is that it is about the students. The artwork, you know, when I say fine art photographs, is about me. It's about my vision of the world and my artistic creativity. The workshops are not about me, they're about the, the students. <clears throat> they are designed to help the students in any which way they want and they need. Every aspect of photography. I'm sorry, it's very dry now, isn't it? Yeah, don't worry. <clears throat> very, very dry. Um, that's why I drink water. But <clears throat> um, so we cover every aspect of photography from the field work, which is the capture of the image, to the processing, the printing, the matting, the framing, and then the marketing. All, all of that is done you know, one step at a time. Uh, that's, uh, that's good info. So let's go back to this conversation then with regards to, which uh, we were talking just before the show, with regards to the, the quality 
mm. against the quantity. And and I think you basically really summed it up earlier on that obviously you were getting, as we would say in the UK here, swamped with work, um, mm -hmm. and you you basically just couldn't carry on and, and in and at that pace. So it made sense for you to slow down and put your prices up. But the one thing which you were saying earlier on to me in discussion just before the show, when we were talking about the quality of work and and your input into that work, mm -hmm. um, I, I termed it, you weren't divorcing yourself down the line and getting someone else to do the printing, which is quite obviously what you could have done when you had that maximum swamp of work coming through. Right. Just talk to well, me about how you feel about this, uh, Alan. Well, I, I never actually had somebody print for me except for Cibochrome printing. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> before I did digital prints, I was doing Cibochromes, and uh, Cibochromes could not be done at home because of the, the amount of equipment necessary. So I had a lab work yeah. with me. But even though I was doing, as having somebody else print my work, I was working with them one on one. So I was physically present in the lab watching the print being made. So it's as close as possible to yeah. doing it yourself, just because you don't have the equipment. That being said, everything else after that was done by me. And even though I could have been tempted to have somebody else print for me, when I was sitting at the Grand Canyon, the National Park, because I, I was under contract with the National Park, uh, mandated that all the work had to be done by the artist. So, right, okay. so I could not do it. So I was forced, you know, like it or not, you know, to... Uh, have everything done by me. In in the end, it was the right decision because, like I said, and I said to a lot of my students, you know, whenever I get the question, should I print my own work? My answer is always the same. How would you like to buy an Ansel Adams photograph made by somebody else than Ansel Adams? Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you provide your own answer to that because if you're looking for an investment, you're not going to get much of an investment if the work is done by somebody else, right? You know, a Cezanne not painted by Cezanne doesn't have much value, right? Yeah, very true. <laughs> Ansel yeah. Adams done by somebody else on Ansel Adams doesn't have much value. The value of art is in being made by the artist. And there are exceptions. We can find little graphs of Dali and Picasso that are highly prized, although they are far fewer than the original painting in terms of money. So in if you look at the traditional approach to art, if, paintings, you have painting, Little graph and then perhaps posters, right? Cheap littles, right? Little, little yes. graph, you know, mass produced lit littles, you know, that are done on a printing press, not on a stone, right? Yes. Well, in photography, if you look at what's going on now in the world of photography, a lot of photographers, because they don't know how to market their work to get the high prices, they basically start at the level of printing posters and price their work accordingly. So they are selling work for anywhere from $15 to $100 or $200 or $300. And well, they miss the, the little graph part, which is the reproduction, high quality reproduction, and they obviously miss the original part, which is the, the work price in the five figures, six figures, or seven figures prices. Mm -hmm. The if other thing is. Let, let me just finish that. If you follow sorry. that approach, it's virtually impossible to make a living at this because you don't have the volume. The only way you can justify low prices is if you can compensate with high volume. But when you just start in photography, you have no volume. You know, my first year, I was maybe lucky that I had 20 customers, you know. Yes. Uh, my first, second year, I may have had a couple hundred. Even at my peak, I did not have more than, you know, thousands, you know. Yeah. But the point which you were, you were making earlier on, the, the point which you were making earlier on with regards to you doing the work and you, you doing the photography and the print and the marketing and everything, you were basically keeping the finances within within your household. You weren't you weren't paying someone else to do that work, so money wasn't going out of your household apart from obviously material costs. But yeah, what you well, were doing was you were earning. I mean, it can be looked at that way. Although, in in being so busy as I was, if I had had somebody else do all of that, I could have t taken more time selling and made more money. So that that was not really you know the right equation. The problem was that you know the national park had wanted me to print everything myself. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, if I was back in the same volume situation and I did not have that requirement to make everything myself, having it mass produced by somebody else is suddenly the option because then you can spend more time selling. Because mm -hmm. I have to spend one third of my time printing, matting, and shipping, and one third selling. So I was actually selling on a very small amount of time. Um, but the, the problem is that if you do that now, not only are you not printing, but you're mass printing by somebody else. Somebody else is mass printing for you. So the price, the quality goes even further down. Yes. Right? Yes. The, the concept of fine art is that 
it is air and art and it is fine. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and to be an art, it has to be done by the artist and to be fine, it has to be printed in, in the best way possible. Right? Yeah. So yeah. that's what I'm doing. You know, when I made that switch to quality, that, that's basically what I did as a choice. And yeah. that's what I'm teaching to my students that um, you, you don't need to mass produce. You, you can produce a very small quantity at a very high quality level and, and make a very good living at it if you know how to market it. And yeah. that's, that's the marketing model. That's, that's the only marketing model that can work for art. Yeah, as for the, the, your description there of fine heart was just nailed it for me. That, that, uh, that's, that's a really good <laughs> explanation of it. Yeah, it's, I think it's not mass produced art and it's not mass produced reproductions or it's not mass produced. Uh, um, yeah. Um, what do we call it? Um, um, documentation. It's art, right? Yes, yeah. Because that's another yeah. problem that people have with digital photography. They think that we're doing documentation when we're doing art. You know, they, they don't. Yeah, I think I, I, there is there is a, obviously a period of time where you there is. I wrote a blog a short while ago because there's a lot of. Uh, um, talk now in Europe with regards to street photography, whether it should be allowed and, 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 the, and the photography of, of, of panoramas, of buildings and this sort of thing. And mm -hmm. I, I believe that if you, if you stop street photography, which I take as documenting the, the street itself, then you're going to kill history. But that's a totally different aspect from what you're doing, the fine art uh, photography. I don't have a problem with landscapes yet, although I, I think that one of the outcomes of the millions of people that are embracing photography because of the ease of digital photography and the omnipresence of cameras, you know, every device now has a camera, whether yeah. it's a phone, a tablet, or a laptop, or now we have even clothing with cameras on them. Uh, cars have cameras, you know, yes. new cars are come equipped with ca rear cameras, but it's not going to be long until they come equipped with front cameras with a hard disk drive to record the video in case of a crash, right? Yeah, exactly right. You know, yeah, the, the car industry is very slow to react to everything. You know, they, they take five to 10 years. I mean, look at how long it took them to put a CD player in the cars, right? You know, it's, it's mind boggling. You know, we are just starting to put iPod connectors in the cars. So they are very slow, but eventually we'll have front facing cameras that will record video for crash purposes. Yeah. Well, the only presence of cameras is resulting in an increased legalization of photography where places that had no concern whatsoever with people taking photographs are now being concerned with people taking photographs. Cities, uh, the France um, copyrighted the Eiffel Tower. They couldn't copyright the Eiffel Tower because it's a cultural icon, but they copyrighted the light display at night, the yes. night illumination of the, the Eiffel Tower. So that if you want to sell a night photograph of the Eiffel Tower that shows the lights, you have to get a, 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 a license, basically, clearance from the French government. Uh, you know yeah. why? Because everybody is trying to sell a photo of the Eiffel Tower. You know that's why. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I I, I did hear about the lights actually uh, of of, uh, of the Eiffel it's Tower. It's going to increase. You know, they, they'll, they'll eventually. Well, it, it, yes, it will increase. But it, you know, the you know, we had a lot of it. Everyone sort of says it's a security issue because of uh, whatever it's problems, it but it's not. But it's not the only no. reason. The only re the other reason is money. People see exactly. when you see ten million people making a buck, you want a little bit of it. <laughs> exactly yeah yeah very true come to that time of the show alan where i want to ask you uh, my two favorite questions who would you say has been your inspiration in your work well when i started i was very very influenced uh by by you know photographers like Ansel adams edward weston david munch you know um the, the leaders uh, at the time of uh, you know landscape photography and to some extent, I still appreciate their work, but I'm much more interested now in what I can do with my own work. But my, my fascination has become an exploration of the possibilities of digital photography and not a reproduction of what was done before. I'm, yes. I'm not concerned with redoing what was done before. In the beginning, I was. I was going to places that I had seen photographs and I wanted to do the same photo that I had seen. And that has become, you know, fairly unsatisfying now. So I, I have yeah. changed. My influence yeah. is also painters. You know, I'm... I'm obviously almost more interested today by painters than by photographers and well, i was going to suggest that actually because the way you're actually doing your work on uh, at the editing stage is you're right. bringing in your own personal feeling about it so yeah that the likes of you mentioned earlier on cezanne and uh, as a as an artist for one I, I don't think we could really bring picasso into into that sort of uh uh, area of discussion, but certainly Cezanne probably, I, I would assume, is one painter which you would have found a, a, an inspiration from. Well, every, every, I mean, every movement, you know, people say, I like Cezanne, I don't like Picasso. Well, we, you know, we are really talking about impressionism, 
post-impressionism and Fazism for, for Cezanne and yeah. Cubism with Picasso. We can't really compare yeah. it. It's almost like saying, no, very true. You can't. Oh, I, don't, I like Vans, I don't like sports cars. Well, you're not supposed to, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, either one or the other is, is fine, you know. But um, there is something to be learned from all of them. And, and Cezanne, obviously, for the light and the colors. Cézanne was also the first uh, artist to start Cubism, you know, Les Maisons Carrées, or Les Maisons à l'Estac, which was uh, a, a, the, the critic that first looked at the painting uh, said, these look like square houses, and, and he called, you know, this, that's where the word Cubism came from, he says they're cubes. And mm -hmm. that gave birth to the word Cubism. Um, so Cézanne was a very early Cubist. Uh, Cézanne's career is very interesting, and that's why I mention him, because it covers all the way from Impressionism to Cubism. So Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, Favism, and then Cubism. Well, Picasso basically picks up at the, you know, with realism and then Cubism, you know, so it's a much shorter breath in terms of the art movements, you know. But yeah. all of these movements have something important to bring, whether it is color, light, form, or, you know, a particular approach to transforming the subject, you know. I love yeah. Dali for the imagination. Dali had a very, very rich career, produced a phenomenal number of work, I mean, probably more than any other um, painter of that era, and yet there is no duplication. There is very little duplication. You look at his work and it's constantly evolving, you know. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and I strongly encourage photographers to look at art. Actually, I encourage photographers to look, to collect art. I'm, I'm hey. always sort of a, a little bit at a loss when I, I have a student and I say, tell me about your art collection, and they're, they're like, I don't have one. And, yeah. You know, that's an interesting yeah. point, actually, because we did do an exercise that with my camera club a couple of years ago where they were asked to go away, look at some artists and come back. And I was amazed at how many different uh, artists came in, obviously the obvious ones, the Monets and the Cezannes and, and uh, the Picassos. But and, but there were so many different artists coming in, which I, I just hadn't even heard of. But So it's a very interesting aspect to take. Who, though, Alan, at the moment, or if there is one at the moment or in the past, would you consider as your favorite photographer? I, right now, I don't have one. Yeah, because in a sense, I, like I said, I evolved from being very influenced by these early uh, masters to being really interested in my own work and actually spend more time looking at paintings. I'm, I'm, yeah, so I, I don't think I have one. Yeah. You don't have one. I, I see a lot of work being done today, but I'm not sure that there is a direction, and that's sort of what bothers me. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Alan, thank you so much for joining us. We've we're literally two minutes under the, under the fifty minutes which we set up for you. Which gives you just exactly the right uh, time to get yourself prepared for uh, your talk yeah. on the phone to your uh, student. Thank you yeah. so much for joining me today from uh, from your yeah. home and uh, a great, great, great discussion about all aspects, especially about the 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 productivity side of uh, of uh, your photography life and uh, I found that really really interesting and I hope everyone who's been watching the show finds that as interesting as me I didn't say this before the show in actual fact I keep forgetting to mention this to my guests that uh, if you are going shooting this weekend if you're going out with your camera this weekend for me I'm going to leave my camera bag at home all the best to you bye for now thank you Paul